What's up, everybody? Sunday session, episode 39, here to deliver a ton of information about growing your e-commerce business. My name is Eric Catalano. I'm a son, I'm a boyfriend, I'm a cousin, I'm a business owner, and I'm just a regular guy with big dreams and aspirations that I continue to take action on every day. So excited to have all of you here. Uh, the purpose of these is I go live every Sunday as often as possible, and I answer your questions. Right, I put the pieces of the puzzle together. So anything you got for me, I'm here to help. It's a pleasure, an honor, and a privilege to be able to be hanging out with all of y'all on this beautiful Sunday afternoon or morning or evening, wherever you are in the world. Abdul, what's up, brother? How you living, man? Did you solve that issue we were talking about the other day? With the distributor, the prep center, they going to go swing by and check it out. Uh, the distributor was not working with Amazon sellers. All good. You move on to the next one. What I love about this game is, is it really separates the weak from the ones who will prevail, right? Because like, there's a difference between someone telling you no, they won't open a wholesale account, and you just quitting and being like, okay, I can't open a wholesale account. But the way I like to look at it is, whenever, whenever anybody tells me no, it just means no today. It doesn't mean no in seven days or thirty days or sixty days or ninety days. So I keep persistent with them, you know, sending them emails. So when an opportunity does open, I'm at the forefront of their mind. That's why I go to so many trade shows as well, because to have that human interaction, invite some of these vendors to lunch, like, because one thing I've learned over the years is Amazon sellers make mistakes. So there's a few reasons why a distributor wouldn't want to do business with you or a wholesaler or a brand. One, they are exclusively working with a few Amazon sellers already. And in that case, Amazon sellers make mistakes. So you'll be able to pop in when one of them are kicked off of the listings because they weren't abiding map or they were, you know, selling expired inventory or they weren't paying their bills, whatever the case may be, right? The other is Amazon selling directly. Amazon selling directly, there's so many cons. They have crazy long net terms, 90 to 180 days. The brand deals with the same seller support that we deal with. So it's a nightmare. Amazon doesn't care about map pricing when they're when you're dealing with one piece. So there's a lot of negatives um, with one P. So like opportunities will open up in the future. So don't take no as a, as a lifelong no. It's not a lifelong no. And then the third opportunity is the brand or the manufacturer or the distributor or wholesaler selling their products themselves, which is a lot of work. We all know we operate Amazon businesses. It's not an easy business to operate. There's a lot of um, processes and systems that most people don't have implemented in their infrastructure. So you could pitch them that, hey, don't worry about Amazon. You focus on building your brand Right, creating more SKUs, taking care of social media, making sure your website is on point, fulfilling orders. Like, I'll take care of everything on the Amazon end. I'll manage returns, I'll deal with customer acquisition and customer inquiries, I'll do all the shipping, I'll manage your inventory, I'll manage your pricing, I'll run ads, I'll do everything for you. Right. So, a no today is not a no, a definite no forever. I have an ASIN that sells 3K a month, gross is 12%, $3 in production cost per ASIN is $125. So would you still go for it? Absolutely. So this gentleman just said, uh, Tech News said he's got a product that he's doing about 3K a month in. So 3,000 units or $3,000? Either way, it doesn't matter. Gross profit's 12%. Average profit's $3 and it's cost them $1.25 to get the product out the door. So absolutely, I keep buying that product. That means your net profit on every single order is a buck seventy-five. So if you're selling 3,000 orders a month, that's a, that's a heavy hitter product. That's almost 6K in profit. Oh, units. Yeah, that's almost 6K a profit a month. Absolutely, I would sell that product all day long. And you have 20% 20, 20 of the buy box. So that's a heavy hitter skew right there. You know, you're only getting 20% and you're selling 3,000 units a month. So <laughs> that listing's moving, what, 15,000 units a month? That's a heavy hitter skew right there, man. That's a great one. Um, for FBM orders, where do we recommend buying shipping labels from? I recommend buying uh, FBM shipping labels directly through Amazon, right? Amazon provides a level of protection for FBM orders uh, when you purchase it through Seller Central. But when you start using third-party softwares like uh, ShipStation or going direct to UPS or USPS, 
Um, you just got to document a lot more information. So I always suggest buying FBM shipping fees from a seller central directly. How many emails to send to a distributor a day? I mean, let's say 50 distributors are on my list, how to manage them. So you can use a CRM. Uh, Asana is a great CRM. We use HubSpot as a CRM. So what you could do is use a CRM and you could actually set up flows for these distributors. So let's say you send an email to a distributor today, the distributor never responds. You can have an automatic email follow-up, right? Specific to that distributor that sends an email in four to five days, right? And then if they don't respond again, you could set a notification that lets you know, hey, this is the second time you emailed this vendor, um, it's time to call them, right? And then you get on the phone. Keep in mind that phone, sometimes it weighs a thousand pounds. It's very hard to pick up. But in the day and age that we're in, where some of these vendors have thousands, thousands of sellers reaching out to them annually to open up accounts, sometimes you got to separate yourself from the herd. Pick up that phone, you know, pop into the trade show that they're going to. Pick up the phone and ask them what trade shows they're going to and that you'd love to pop by, right? And stop in and meet them personally, take them out to lunch, have a conversation about the opportunity. Like, what are you going to do that's going to separate yourself from the crowd? Um, Asana is the software. HubSpot's another one. Um, I think ClickUp is another one. Uh, Monday.com is another one. These are all CRMs um, that we, we've used or people in our community use to kind of track supplier leads. You know, whenever anybody asks me like what type of products they should be selling on Amazon, I just tell them like what you see at a Walgreens, CVS, and Rite Aid, right? Those are the products that we make all our money on. You know, but we don't buy them from those locations. But if you're just getting started, it's a great place to start. We get them in bulk from wholesalers and distributors. Eric, what does your course involve and what more can we learn from it? So it's funny. Let me actually pop open an email. Um, this is an email I got today about our course, right? So it says, Blase Blase introduces ourselves. We started out drop shipping on Amazon.ca and Amazon.uk. And after two years, they're selling around $200,000 to $300,000 a month on those markets. He would like to enter the wholesale market. He said, I noticed that you're offering a course, a wholesale course. I checked the details of the course and I realized that I'm very familiar with all of the content. So I'd like to know in what other areas I can get your help. I just need reputable wholesale companies and some good products to list. And this is my response. I appreciate, I appreciate you reaching out. I know you said you believe you know everything in the course, but you're doing 200,000 to $300,000 per month. And I'm doing five and a half million per month. Although you think you know everything, you definitely do not. Our course is so much more than just training. It's live weekly coaching, private community access. I think you're selling yourself short by saying you know everything. I highly recommend joining these sellers or I. Our programs allow, allow sellers your size to two to five extra your business in 12 months. Don't let your inability to accept help stop you from growing. Inside my community, we teach you ways to close more wholesale accounts, where to find them, and the live coaching and private community access is to answer any questions along the way, right? So we meet you where you're at, right? We have sellers at all different levels who join our program, brand new, experienced, medium-sized, doesn't matter, right? It's more of the infrastructure. So yeah, absolutely. Are there going to be some things you know? Sure. Are there going to be a lot of things that are illuminated through our program and our community and the live weekly coaching that you get for four months and access to over 700 wholesale businesses through our private Facebook group? Absolutely. The minute you think you know it all is the minute you stop growing. I've been in the game for 10 years. I'll never say I know it all. I'll never send an email to anybody like the one I just received from that gentleman saying, hey, I know it all. What can you really teach me? No, no, that mindset is going to stunt your growth and not allow you to continue to grow and thrive. So you got to chill with that. Chill with that mindset. That is not the growth mindset that you need. But essentially, our course covers pretty much everything you can imagine. Right, because my goal in East Sellers Rise is to get you to be a seven-figure seller, a multiple seven-figure seller. So then you could join Inner Circle, and we can help you grow your business even more to eight figures. That's the end of the day. When Source Correct coming out for East Sellers Rise? So it's still in beta. I don't have a timeline for you right now. We have about forty users on it in in Inner Circle. Uh, they love it. It's very efficient. Right now, we're also adding some new features to it, like uh, 2D um, shipping software as well as automatic reordering. There's a lot of things that we're adding to it. So I do not have a timeline for when 
um, source prep will be released to the public. Right now, our main focus is to provide it to our inner circle community members so they can continue to thrive because they've made the investments in themselves while we work out the kinks of the software. For grocery items, when customer returns due to missing fulfillment promise or damage during transit, do we get reimbursed for that or is it a loss? So if it's through FBA, Amazon should be able to handle that for you if it's lost during transit for your returned items. Missing fulfillment promise because there's no returns on grocery items, but based on what you told me, the customer never received it. So it's damaged during transit. So that that means it's a completely different category. So you should be able to get a Amazon to reimburse you for those. Amazon's not accepting your EE distribution invoice. Keep submitting it. I suggest also printing it out. You can highlight the UPC. You can write the ASIN next to it. You can circle that it's been paid. You can circle that it's been an invoice. You want to point out all the pertinent information. Um, and you want to make sure that it has your company information, a phone number, your address. You also want to make sure that it has the distributor or wholesales information, a website, a contact email, because this is how approvals work. I own a wholesale company. I used to sell to a lot of Amazon sellers. What happens is I fulfill an order to an Amazon seller and Amazon, when they submit the invoice for approval, Amazon actually calls me directly. And they say, hey, I have invoice number 11111 here. Um, can you confirm how many units are of item number 123? And I'll say, oh, this customer orders 72 units of item number 123. Check. Okay. And then they'll say, hey, how many units of item number 1234 did they order? And I'll say they ordered 48 units of item number 1234. And they say, check. And they say, okay, awesome. Confirm. Thank you. And then they will approve you for that category. So sometimes it takes multiple submissions and they actually do reach out to the wholesaler. That's why creating inauthentic invoices is no bueno. Highly advise against it. It's a great way to get your account shut down. I don't, I'm, a, I'm at a weird stage with my watch. I don't know if anybody's ever experienced this, but I'm at a very awkward stage. I'm at the stage between two holes where the first hole is just too loose and the second hole is too tight. And I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. Like, do I just eat, eat some food, plump up a little bit? Do I get a little thinner? Like, I don't know what to do. It's a very awkward stage for my watch right now. It's making me very uncomfortable. Uh, on gating categories, talk about it. It's very straightforward. Essentially, always follow the prompts all the way through. So this is something I just had a phone call with a, a young lady in our course the other day, and she didn't know that when it says um, request approval, like keep clicking all the way through, right? Because it's going to give you sometimes an auto on gate. Most people just stop right there and they're like, oh man, I'm not going to be able to sell this product. I'm going to give up, you know, but that's not the case. Follow the prompts all the way through. Sometimes you'll have auto on gates. And if you don't have an auto on gate, it will tell you exactly what you need to get on gated. And usually it's an invoice with at least 10 units on it. Um, from a reputable wholesaler, distributor, manufacturer, or brand that you can submit for ungating. So it's a very simple process. Don't overcomplicate it. And about three or four days ago, I posted a video on Instagram um, that gives you seven companies that have very low MOQs and their invoices work for approval. Are you struggling to get ungated in categories to sell on Amazon? The ungate gurus are going to hate me for this one. Use these seven websites that have low minimum order quantities and their invoices work for approval. So you can use them, 100%. Uh, Eric, I contacted a wholesaler and they won't let me deliver to my home because I don't have a warehouse. The sales rep said he would keep me on file. What would be your advice? So you have three options if they won't ship to your home. You can ask if they could ship it direct to Seller Central or Amazon, not Seller Central. You can use Amazon Prep Services. Now, keep in mind, if there's any bundles or multi-packs, it's not something they'll be able to do because Amazon does not offer prep services for bundles and multi-packs. Or you can ask if they could ship it to a prep center. And if they ship it to a prep center, the prep center can bundle your item, package it, do bundles and multi-packs, all of that, and then send it to Amazon. You just got to weigh out the cost structure and the fees for shipping to the prep center if there is one. Uh, the fee to prep the item as well as the fee to get it shipped to Amazon. And then the third option would be to partner with a local UPS box. You know, I know a lot of people in our community, they have UPS boxes. And some of these UPS boxes, you're able to ship pallets to. You know, I know Jorge in our business, in our uh, course, for a little while there, he was getting two, three pallets sent to uh, a UPS box. You just got to have a call or a talk with the manager. And then something else you can do is partner with local businesses. 
right? So let's say you got a friend who has a warehouse, he lives right down the street, or he's got a storefront, you could actually use their address to get the product shipped to, and it would be invoiced to you. Yeah, Dylan, great question. So any chance you could go over how focusing on ROI can cause issues? Yeah, so wh whether you're using, I prefer to use gross margins when I'm analyzing products for profitability, and the reason why is ROI gets skewed, right? Because let's say your minimum ROI is 50%. Uh, we average about a 35% ROI. So let's say your minimum ROI is 50%, right? But the dollar costs you two bucks. You're only making a dollar on it. You know, now a minimum ROI of 50% on a $10 product, that's $5, right? So there's a huge discrepancy when it's lower cost items and higher cost items, right? Because a $100 product, your minimum ROI is 50%, you know? So you're saying you only will buy a $100 product if you're going to make 50 bucks on it? That's pretty outlandish. I'd buy a hundred dollar product if I'm making 25 on it. That's cool with me, but you're going to miss out on those opportunities because you're focused on ROI and not gross margins. Now, regardless of what, what model you use, whether it's ROI or gross margins, I, and another reason I like RO, uh, gross margins over ROI is because when you talk and you run your, your taxes at the end of the year, you're talking to your CPA, they don't, nobody talks about ROI. They don't say, hey, you invested this much and you made this much in your business. No, they're talking about gross pro or gross and net profit dollars. Your company produced this much money in gross profits and after expenses, it was this much money in net profits. That's how CPAs talk. That's how financial people talk. So like, I don't want to run my business off ROI if when I'm analyzing my business at the end of the year, I'm not analyzing it using ROI. I'm analyzing it using gross and net profit margins. And then also you need to have, whether you're using ROI or gross profit margin, you need to have a minimum buying requirement, right? Because let's go back to our ROI of 50%. If the, God, if the product costs you two bucks, you're only making a dollar on it. But if you have a minimum requirement, a dollar amount of say, three bucks, then that product won't pass. So it has to be a, a gross margin requirement, let's say 10% and the dollar amount, let's say $3. So it has to meet 10% and $3 or it will not pass your check. So this is a great question. When inventory, when buying inventory, what's your usual turnaround? All right, so everybody, if you're at if you're at a computer right now, if you're at a desk, obviously, smash a little hamburger in the top left of Seller Central, go to inventory, which is the second option down, and then click inventory planning, right? And then in the top right, it will say days in inventory and it will tell you how many inventory turns you have a year, right? So right now ours is a little high. Last week it was, it was closer to 10, which is where we really try to fall. Uh, but right now our average day in inventory is about 45 days, which is about 8.1 turns. So that means our average SKU is in stock and available for sale for about 45 days. So Amazon will give you that information. The closer to 10 you can get, the healthier your business is. I look at a lot of companies where they have two terms a year. That's crazy. That means your average product's in stock for 180 days. Imagine you decrease that you know, to 30 days or 45 days. That means you could flip that inventory an additional four times and get profit out of it. Four times over the course of 180 days, possibly even five or six if you have closer to 12 terms a year. So pop into inventory planning, see what your days in inventory is, how many turns you have, and pay attention to that number. You should be checking it weekly. How do I make a jump from prepping at home to a small warehouse and employees to handle prep? So housekeep up, it sounds like you're at a point now where you realize a, a warehouse could be really beneficial for you. And absolutely it can be. Um, so I'm imagining your, your current home setup is getting a little crowded and there's not enough space. So the first thing you wanna do is look for some warehouse space um, and run the numbers. All right. And regardless of the numbers, it sounds like you need it right now. So even if the numbers to you don't make sense, think about the opportunity that presents itself when you have your own warehouse, you know, because now you can open up more wholesale accounts. You could save money on shipping because you have a bay door. So you're not paying lift gate service fees. You can open accounts that only ship to uh, commercial residences, right? Now you can hire some packers. So first step would be to jump on LoopNet, um, you know, or Google and start looking for warehouses for lease or for rent in your area, right? Go visit some of them, run the numbers, and then make the commitment and just pull the trigger, right? And then the goal would be to, your first employee would be a packer, someone to package your inventory. Uh, you get the highest ROI in your business on a packer, right? The most important position in your job is your buyer, second most important is the packer, and the packer delivers the highest ROI on the payment that you get, provide them. Because think about it like this way, you could pay a packer, let's just say $20 an hour, that's $160 a day. 
we'll use this gentleman who gave me some numbers before, right? He said average profit was $3. It cost him $1.25 to get out the door. He's making $1.75 in profit, right? So at $1.75 in profit on your packer, let's say your packer, on, on average, we're super efficient. Our packers produce per packer about 450 aces a day. Let's just call it 300 aces a day to be a little more realistic. So we're going to do 300 times $1.75 in net profits. That's $525 in net profits a day that that packer's, packer's making you. Minus $160 to pay that packer. So $525 minus $160. That packer's making you $365 a day times five days a week. That, prop, that packer is making you $1,825 a week in net profits times 52 weeks. That packer is making you $94,900 a year, right? And then the more efficient you get your packer, if that packer is able to go from producing 300 units a day to 350 or 400 units a day, you're just adding net profits to your bottom line, right? And you scale it out. So this packer is making you almost 100 grand a year. In profits, one packer at 300 units a day, if you're able to increase his production, he'll bump that up to $120,000 in profit a year, right? And then you get two packers, and now you're talking $200,000 in net profits a year by scaling out your packing team because you should not be packing. As a business owner, it's the first position you need to insource, not outsource. You can outsource it to a prep center, but insource. Insource is the best because then you have control, quality control, which is crucial. So packers have incredible ROI. Most people fail to realize that. And also most people are so focused on being in their business that they fail to step out by hiring a team so they can focus on growing the company instead of doing the day-to-day. -day. The day-to-day -day is great in the beginning. You gotta understand the fundamentals. But in order to thrive and grow, you can't do the day-to-day -day every day. You can't be the one who's buying all your inventory, packaging all your inventory, shipping all your inventory, reviewing all your reports. You can't be that person forever or your business will never grow. Uh, average cost of goods for total sales for your typical wholesale business is between 40 and 45%. So let's say you want to do $100,000 in monthly sales. In order to do $100,000 in monthly sales, you'll have to spend about 40 to $45,000 on inventory. It's a great number to understand. It's a great question as well. Y'all are getting better with these questions. I feel like every weekend, I feel like every weekend these questions are getting better. Any questions from the YouTube side? I don't know what's going on here.